So we're here to talk about infographics and making infographics, but we're going to get a little bit here into um, what uh, designers define an infographic as. And basically infographic is short for information graphic. It's a visual representation of a specific set of data. There's no rigid definition of what makes an infographic, but it's usually a form of data, data visualization like pie charts or bar graphs, all assembled together to illustrate a message. The goal behind an infographic is that your audiences see the information instead of read it. So, we're going to be looking at plenty of infographics throughout this. Here's a little infographic on infographics. Uh, graphic depictions of information have been around for thousands of years. We have examples from early cave paintings, hieroglyphics, and religious artwork. But one of our first and clearest examples of what we consider a modern infographic uh, comes from the Victorian era, and it was made by Florence Nightingale. Uh, this image made an impression on Parliament for the way it presented deaths in the British Army uh, during wartime. So it's kind of one of the first that's really recognized as, as fitting the mold of what we know as an infographic. Uh, during the early 1900s, uh, these kinds of illustrations started becoming very popular in publications. And by the 70s, designers really began studying the art of information design. Uh, one of the uh, top writers on the subject was this guy here named Edward Tufte. And he wrote this book, uh, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. If you wanted to uh, look that up yourself, there's a classic book on, on data visualization. And he's noted for his writings on information design and as a pioneer in the field of data visualization. The guy that kind of introduced me to infographics when I was a pretty young guy was this guy, David McCauley. I got this book when I was young and it was called The Way Things Work. I don't know if you've seen this one, but it's really a, a, a giant book of infographics. This is his drawing depicting uh, the circulatory system as a roller coaster. So he would illustrate these uh, complex systems or uh, if they were a CD player, a record player. Uh, one of the things he did in this book, uh, The Way Things Work, is Everything was in a giant scale, and there were cave people, and the mammoths turned these uh, cogs and gears, and it kind of it broke everything down in, into uh, parts and blew it up to a mass scale so that you had a little bit better understanding, but it really made an impression on me. We're going to talk about uh, why infographics are better for showing information right now. When your information is written, your, aud your audience interprets it. When, is it. when it is illustrated, your audience experiences it. An infographic communicates faster than text. Media researchers have found that human process visual information 60,000 times faster than text, and visual aids can improve learning by up to 400%. An infographic is visually compelling. The, gra the average page view of an infographic is newspaper is 30 times that of text-based articles. Since infographics integrates writing in analysis into graphics, understanding complex data is made easy. To capture one's attention, infographics should be informative yet visually compelling. Because graphics are more attractive than text-based, they are more flexible and effective. Infographics show valuable ideas and information. The information that they try to deliver to the people is more vital than the colors that you see in it. You could be impressed by how, long, by how it is being presented, but you will actually be more impressed by the kind of information you will get from it. <coughs> Plus, they reduce boredom. <laughs> Complex information will bore you to tears, especially if there's a lot of text to read. Not many people like to spend a lot of time understanding facts and figures and reading a lot of text. Some may do, but most won't. You can get the same information in a much simpler manner through infographics. And infographic catches one's interest. Even those who are unaware of important facts and figures will have an interest 
and looking at infographics. The designs will captivate those who do not have an interest in the subject matter. Subject matter. A very effective way of presenting facts, figures, and information. They're easily available. You can find them all over the web. They can easily be printed on paper, and since they're images, they can be easily searched on the web. Anyone can see them and have easy access. They're more convincing. Due to its unique way of presenting information and its clear manner of arrangement, it can easily persuade the readers. They are more convincing and effective. And they're more memorable. The use of bright colors, graphs, shapes, and images make it easy for infographics to be remembered by the viewers. Images are easier to keep in one's memory. TV ads are effective through the use of visual presentation and give off the similar effect. Uh, while we're talking about TV ads, we're going to talk about the different purposes of infographics. And one of the big ones that really established infographics um, was driven through ads and advertising and companies wanting to get their message across uh, effectively and memorably and quickly um, for a short attention span audience. So the f one of the first purposes is commercial branding and marketing. And Pizza Hut actually has made this infographic, which is uh, a little fun way to brand. It's a flow chart. Uh, another purpose of infographics is editorial. Uh, and brand uh, infographics. These graphics are designed to have mass appeal, placing the creator as an interesting source of information within an industry or on a specific topic. These infographics have the potential to be shared frequently online, bringing traffic links and brand exposure with it. Other purposes are educational, instructional, uh, political and opinion, or agenda related, and uh, also fun and entertainment. Uh, this is obviously, um, well, it's, it's political, but it's more of a, a fun bent to it also, uh, an informative bent to it. Uh, it just basically tells, um, well, what is it here, political brands, uh, which brands fall on which side of the political spectrum. Uh, we're going to talk about the types of infographics now. Uh, you guys have seen all kinds and are probably very familiar with the individual types of infographics. Here's another infographic on infographics. Infographic creators, uh, <laughs> I think they uh, really like to make them because they make infographics about infographics now. So we're going to start talking about the different types here. Uh, we're going to start with pie charts, which is something you guys have probably seen a lot of. Uh, the pie chart is one of the most common chart types of an infographic. They are really simple and the viewer understands the information right away. Uh, the data needs to be precise and shown accurately in each pie slice shown. Uh, pie charts can be an effective way of displaying information in some cases, in particular if the aim is to compare the size of a slice with the whole pie, rather than comparing the slices among them. Pie charts work especially well when the slice represents 25 to 50 percent of the data. So this is a good example of that. We don't really have very many variable, you know, we have three uh, formats that we're talking about here and it's shown very clearly what the distinction between each one is. And it's also presented in a real aesthetically pleasing way. This on the other hand is a bad example of a pie chart. <laughs> This is a mess and kind of torture on the eyes trying to find each individual slice here. And I think uh, around here all these lines just kind of turn into one. So it's pretty awful. Don't do that. Uh, pie charts are all about showing relationships between the individual parts of a thing. If your pie slices don't add up to the entire sum of your whole, then it may not be the best way to illustrate your information. Um, as shown in this infamous pie chart here. <laughs> so if you have uh, some gaps in your data there, or if you don't have the, the whole bit of the pie, or if you have some like multiple chunks of a pie that go over the 100%, then maybe you should use something else. Uh, there are many different ways to convey information using pie charts, such as using images as a circle and using bits of the image to make a circle. 
Here's another creative way that they did that. It's a uh, little infographic about uh, Girl Scout cookies. So they actually literally cut up the little pieces. Here's, uh, I think we have a few Star Wars <laughs> infographics in here. So this is one of them. A little pie chart of the Millennium Falcon. So showing uh, box office revenue, I think. Yep. And uh, here's another little simple one, putting a pie chart in the lens of the camera. And a pie chart of pies. So here's our ingredients in very small type. That's kind of a drawback on this one. Type could have been a little bit more clear. And also, uh, like, I'm going to be going, we're going to be discussing kind of the pros and cons of some of the ones we show. So don't be, don't think it's too nitpicky if we start criticizing some of these and maybe asking you guys how we can improve them. Uh, like this one, for instance, based on some of the last images we've seen, uh, what would be kind of an interesting way to improve this, do you think? These are ingredients, These are ingredients of a, that make up a pie. So the, the concept is really good. You know, this is your ratio of blueberry to sugar and whatnot. But if an infographic is all about displaying information quickly, maybe in this section here that's blueberries, uh, for instance, with the last uh, pie chart we looked at, what if that was blueberries? Or if this slice right here was sugar, was a photograph of sugar? And uh, maybe a better format, too, that, that won't make this text so small. These are some interesting ways to do pie charts. You can really mix it up. Very simple pie charts. Just presented in a different format. Uh, next, Carl is going to talk about uh, word clouds. These are one of the easiest to make. There are famous speeches, news articles, slogans, and themes. Even your love letters turn into a visually stunning word cloud. They are attractive arrangements of randomly positioned words where the most important words are bigger than the others. These are fun and easy to create. By far, they're the quick quickest type of inf infographic you can create. As we see here, a bunch of words put together to show an image of Donna Summer and some of her songs that make up her image. Very clever. Here's another example of a Coca-Cola. This is a very simple one of the United States map. And while we're talking about word clouds, uh, the weakness in these last two uh, is you always got to keep in mind that these could be and probably should be shared via social networking. So you kind of want to have your title in there, in, in the image. So if this is just taken off the internet as it has been, there's no context for it. So we always want to keep our title in there and kind of our key associated with the image so that you're not having your image removed from your, your, your data key. Because uh, it, it, it's really, you kind of, it turns into a puzzle to figure out what this is about mm -hmm. if you don't have that. And here's a poor example of a word cloud. It doesn't make up anything, it's just randomly positioned words to make nothing. <laughs> Another example is bar graphs or column charts. Data is displayed either horizontally or vertically and allows viewers to compare items displayed. Data displayed will relate to things like amounts, characteristics, times, and frequencies. A bar graph displays information in a way that helps us to make generalizations and conclusions quick and easy. A typical bar graph will have a label, axis, scales, and bars. Bar graphs are used to display all kinds of information. Also, they are very useful for recording certain information, whether it's continuous or not continuous data. This is a good example here of the top 10 most read books in the world. They did it as a bookcase, and the one that got the most reads is the Holy Bible. 
I like the different kinds of books that they have on here, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, and these are the different types of percentages of each. So it actually starts here, the bar graph, and then you can see the different, that would be one of the... It's kind of a confusing place to put a baseline. First, yeah. yeah. This is a poor example. First of all, it's really small. When you go to try to read it, it's very pixelated, and you can't tell what the information is. Plus, the perspective is a little off, I would think. Yeah, when you're doing a bar graph, it's all about size relations. So if you introduce perspective into it, you're really going to muck up your relationship scale. Another type is comparison charts. These are for measuring or comparing the qualities of related things. Your intention for using a comparison chart can affect how you create them. There are usually two different types. From an independent perspective, you can see them to create unbiased measurement of items. The comparison of information is presented as impartially as possible to provide your audience with the facts you and they consider important. On the other hand, from an, from an opinion of marketing perspective, it's us versus them. A comparison chart is good for cherry picking or highlighting the benefits of your choice over others. This is an example here of Android, I guess, versus iPhone. So there's different types for each. The camera, the capacity, the battery life, the video, connectivity, and others. And based on that, I guess you would choose the phone of your choice. <laughs> This is another good example, the moons of the solar system. These are size comparisons of all the planets of the solar system. Now here's the Earth, Mars. See which ones are larger. The Earth is quite small compared to some of these. And this is another example of mapping paid maternity leave. So it gives you an idea of the United States. How many weeks do other nations provide compared to the U.S.? So it's not very good here in the U.S. What do you think could have been another way to improve the information for this? Like first of all, the, one of the things I see is some of the numbers are hard to read on some of the um, nations. So it's hard to see the black on blue and stuff like that. They have a good concept. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and also another thing, if you're working with uh, number values or something, if you want to easily express a number, uh, sometimes scale is a good way to do it. So, you know, the 50 there on Canada could have been larger than the other as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, their, their angle, and, and every infographic has kind of an angle, that they're trying to get across is the United States is, is poorly treated. So maybe if the United States at zero uh, was very small, uh, it would also get the point across too. And you could look at the countries and see automatically by the scale of the numbers uh, which one uh, had more maternity leave instead of looking around and trying to, to parcel out the numbers out of each of those uh, areas there is a little difficult. This is another example of a comparison chart for Thomas Edison versus Tesla. Zoom in on this. So it starts over here with the late bloomers and the falling out of Edison, the battery powered devices, and then we go over to Tesla. This one is full of text. I think it would have been more improved if there was more images instead of, it is data information, but it, there seems to be a lot on this one. So it's a little bit of both. Yeah, the point of the infographic is kind of to keep things short. And while this is like really beautifully done and the graphics are great and everything like that, it's kind of an information overload, which is the opposite of what you want. So maybe if, uh, you sit down and decide, well, what's my hook? What, what do I really want this to be about? What's my main point here? 
and edit out some of this uh, other stuff. Just keep it enough to support your hook and, and maybe leave out some of this other uh, fat, so to speak. Here's another comparison chart of Jurassic Park. What's really cool about it is the comparative size chart of the different dinosaurs compared to the human. This one sort of has an information overload as well, but the image at the bottom is pretty cool, I think. And this one is a pretty cool one. It's very simple, a couple of colors. It's the trilogy meter. Like, which trilogy was the best out of these movies? Star Wars, Indiana Jones. Rocky, Batman. Obviously, some of the some of these, the first one is always better. <laughs> it's. I think this one's really effective. There's not a lot of uh, flourishes to it, but it's just real simple, and you can just scan it and say, "Oh yeah." And it, it, of course, it's opinion based. You know, not everybody. Maybe some people really like Jaws three. You know. <laughs> But you can read it. it. It basically is is everything you want in an infographic. You can just your eyes scan it, and you immediately uh, know at least what this uh, creator's opinion is based on each of these trilogies. What makes you think it's not a profit for tickets sold or something like that? That's a problem too with this one because he doesn't really. I, I know because I, I looked at it and I knew what it was about, and there was extra information. But it was like I was saying earlier, if you don't include that with the image, some kind of, it, it should say the trilogy meter uh, comparisons of quality or something like that. You know, give it some kind of frame or reference because if you don't have that, you wouldn't know and you would make a guess and you may be communicating the wrong message completely, right? And the last comparison is burning fuel, the average car versus the average human. So one gallon of gasoline equals one pint of Guinness times 150. <laughs> Filet mignon, Big Mac, Ben and Jerry's, and a medium banana. And over here you have the same, pretty much the same ones and how much fuel. This one is entertaining yet informative. But we don't know how factual. Yes. <laughs> okay, the next ones we're going to talk about are maps. They are the visual representations of an area. They are a symbolic illustration highlighting relationships between components that space such as objects and regions. They are another great element when designing an infographic. They illustrate the topic in a very clear and crisp manner. Of course, they're the most common used maps the United States, the whole world, and even states or countries. Uh, map infographics can be regular images or they can be an animated as well. There are also plenty of other ways you can approach maps. They can be fantasy, made up, imaginary. Another approach is that you can create a map of where you live, favorite places, you hang out, or work. These are also very useful for distances to and from places. Travelers benefit a lot from map infographics. They don't necessarily need to cover a large area. They can be represented as floor plans of a room, house, or at work. They can even be as simple as planning out your next flower garden. They are also very useful for universities. They can show you where the art building is while looking for the shortest distance from your dorm. Stadiums, bookstores, etc. Maps are a great for that purpose. You can also design map infographics for your route to the university. There are a number of ways maps are useful for college life. They are also great for congested cities such as New York. There you can illustrate the subways, parks, restaurants, and the list goes on. They are also good marketing tools. Companies can track their products or usages with maps. And the example here is Starbucks and Burger King. 
different comparisons in sales. So we see Starbucks over here, McDonald's over here, and then you have Wendy's, KFC, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell down here. This is a cool infographic, but I think the arrows go a little crazy. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, a little busy. Here is another one, the optimization of the Olympic Games. It starts way back when it first, 150 BCE. And then it goes from there to 1912, 1924, when the Radio Olympics were there, Exact Olympics. Not sure what that is. This is kind of like a hybrid infographic. It's mm -hmm. kind of like a timeline and a map combined, mm -hmm. which is perfectly fine. <laughs> the Computer Olympics, the Digital Olympics, the Net Olympics. It goes all the way to last year, the Tech Olympics. Another good example is breweries in the United States. Here it gives you a detailed list of animated map of the different breweries in the whole United States. There's a lot. <coughs> and this is another animated map. If you go on their website, you can click on any area and it will zoom into that area and show you all the streets and everything like that. So the timelines you kind of saw in that other one too, uh, they visually uh, illustrate a succession of events that happen over time, letting the user understand the visualized data quickly and effectively. Um, they're effective for companies to show how they have grown in the years of operation and they're also good for tracking information that businesses gather from, sa from their sales. Here's a really effective timeline. Effective if you're a Mac aficionado, I guess, because you may have trouble uh, identifying what some of these are. But uh, it is really simple, a little branching uh, family tree of products. Uh, this would be nice in an interactive way if you could hover over each of these objects and it could bring up more details. Maybe it does, I'm not sure. I don't think it does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But nice to look at, and it's a really good idea, I think. Here's a timeline that's probably pretty familiar. You see these a lot in magazines, these kind of timelines. Um, shows you the whole progress here, different phases of D-Day. Here's a uh, video game timeline. And a really cool little uh, <laughs> bankruptcies in history timeline of sinking ships analogy here. I really like this one. Your eyes are kind of like immediately drawn to the biggest one right away, right? That's what I do. It was the biggest disaster. And this is a history of primetime television, which probably was one that you could explore mm -hmm. more closely. So a lot of these, and especially the contemporary infographics, are more interactive and uh, they're built in ways that uh, you can add more information to your message so that you can focus in on ind individual parts of it too. So you're, you're able to place more into an infographic uh, nowadays as long as it's not overwhelming at the initial onset. You don't want to frustrate your viewers. Uh, next, we're going to talk about Venn diagrams. They show logical connections between a group of things, usually represented by overlapping circles. 
They can help your audience understand interrelations that may seem too complicated when presented strictly through text or speech. To put it simply, the point where your circles overlap is the comparison, and the area of the circles where they do not is the contrast. So, another cool little one. Another infographic about infographics. This is my favorite Venn diagram of all time. That's too funny. Showcasing the amazing platypus. And a uh, Muppets Venn diagram, which is really kind of interesting. Just going to let you soak it up here. Sure. Human, silly, and descriptive. This was a bad example of a Venn diagram because there's really, this is just a message, uh, some advert, it's just placed in a Venn diagram setting, there's no really comparison. But it actually makes sense and you see it right away. Yeah. A lot of the things you like, I think, are way too big. Yeah. If you don't get it in the first second, yeah. you miss 90% of your audience. Yeah. Well, this one is, is technically off as far as what a Venn diagram does, but it, it does present its message and it does tell it clearly. It's just not technically a Venn diagram. This is another. This is why we are fish. I mean, this would be a lot of words if you wrote all this out, right? And this is another bad uh, Venn diagram that's not even a Venn diagram. It's just an ad. Uh, we also have instructional infographics. Uh, they're informative and give you steps to create multiple things or just give you the important information about a company, technologies, blogs, tips for finances, guides when choosing the right wedding flowers, etc. They can be detailed subject matter such as building a game online or as simple as setting up an account on eBay. So this one is uh, all about building these ancient boats. Something you may never do, but you might have an interest in the process. This is the rent to own process and an infographic. This would have been helpful last year. And uh, spotting a hidden handgun. So kind of a self-defense infographic. Again, illustrating the idea is much more clear than describing it. A picture is always more effective. Just giving an example. How to use a light box. Real simple graphics. I mean, we see these infographics all the time now. You buy something from Ikea that has a set of instructions, <coughs> and it's practically all images now. 
Not that that makes it that easy to put together sometimes still. One on accessibility challenges in email design. How to make Play-Doh. Felt like maybe you could uh, put a little bit more into these steps and use these graphics to support the process more than just as embellishments. So, you know, it wouldn't have been a bad idea, similar to the light box one we looked like, if you detailed these steps with simple illustrations. Six steps to planning a successful conference. It's uh, not bad looking, but the font is a little hard to read, isn't it? Uh, one of the things with infographics is it's good to stay away from uh, these script fonts, unless it's like a title. Um, it's not bad, but if you're working with a body of the text, uh, it may end up very small, so you want to stay with uh, a simple serif or uh, sans serif, preferably. Uh, you know, type without the little accents on it. Now we have flowcharts. So a flowchart on creating an infographic. Here is um, some flowchart symbols. There's common flowchart symbols that you can use. Kind of a nice one. Should your business be on Pinterest? And one that gets a little bit hard to read, but it's still a good idea. An ice cream. Another Star Wars, your Star Wars occupation. You can't tell from up there, but in the background, it has the different characters and weapons in the back. It'd be a bit more. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a nice little subtle silhouette. You don't want, really want your background to overpower it too much. So at the end, you find which character you are, right? Yes. <laughs> are you happy? <laughs> Gets the point across real simply. <clears throat> Scientific theory flowchart. Species identification flowchart. You'll notice all of them, they have a pretty simple palette, color palette. You know, you're only working with two or three at the most. Too much color can overwhelm the senses. This, is, <laughs> this one is called How to Argue on the Nut Without Dropping the F-Bomb. It's a little hard to find your start point, though. <clears throat> now we're going to look at some animated infographics. Okay. Animated infographics are visual illustrations communicating information, but when the graphics are animated, they can be used to represent complex situations tell stories, or they can address social comment, satire, and undermine the power and authority of government. An infographic in motion can be very informative, involving funny, and sometimes surprisingly moving. 
The Crisis of Credit. Visualized. What is the credit crisis? It's a worldwide financial fiasco involving terms you've probably heard, like subprime mortgages, collateralized debt obligations, frozen credit markets, and credit default swaps. Who's affected? Everyone. How did it happen? Here's how. The credit crisis brings two groups of people together, homeowners and investors. Homeowners represent their mortgages, and investors represent their money. These mortgages represent houses, and this money represents large institutions like pension funds, insurance companies, sovereign funds, mutual funds, etc. These groups are brought together through the financial system, a bunch of banks and brokers commonly known as Wall Street. While it may not seem like it, these banks on Wall Street are closely connected to these houses on Main Street. To understand how, let's start at the beginning. Years ago, the investors are sitting on their pile of money, looking for a good investment to turn into more money. Traditionally, they go to the U.S. Federal Reserve, where they buy treasury bills, believed to be the safest investment. But in the wake of the dot-com bust in September 11th, Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan lowers interest rates to only 1% to keep the economy strong. 1% is a very low return on investment, so the investors say, no thanks. On the flip side, this means banks on Wall Street can borrow from the Fed for only 1%. Add to that general surpluses from Japan, China, and the Middle East, and there's an abundance of cheap credit. This makes borrowing money easy for banks and causes them to go crazy with leverage. Leverage is borrowing money to amplify the outcome of a deal. Here's how it works. In a normal deal, someone with $10,000 buys a box for $10,000. He then sells it to someone else for $11,000 for a $1,000 profit, a good deal. But using leverage, someone with $10,000 would go borrow 990,000 more dollars, giving him $1 million in hand. Then he goes and buys 100 boxes with his $1 million and sells them to someone else for $1,100,000. Then he pays back his $990,000 plus $10,000 in interest. And after his initial $10,000, he's left with a $90,000 profit versus the other guy's $1,000. Leverage turns good deals into great deals. This is a major way banks make their money. So Wall Street takes out a ton of credit makes great deals, and grows tremendously rich. And you get the general idea of that. That one was a really good example. The colors are awesome. The explanation is really good. So another one, I'm growing up. Can you really differentiate between animation as opposed to main programs? I presume just No, it's not. It's not. I, I, one of the things about infographics is the borders are real blurry. And anything art related, the borders are blurry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, infographics, if, an, if a map is an infographic, we've had them around forever, right? It's really just an image that, that, um, that gets across information. And, and nowadays, they're becoming kind of their own thing. They're their own area of study and, and there, there's, some strip, there's some more parameters to them now as they're commonly uh, made, but uh, basically the, I guess what, what makes this different than just a typical animation is that it has a point, it has a message. So it's, it's trying to communicate the information of the credit crisis as opposed to just um, you know, entertaining or, or something like that, even though there are entertaining infographics too. So like I said, it, um, but, but that's really the key is, is to just uh, get your message across simply.
and, and let the visuals do most of the talking. This is another interesting one, growing up. It's a short one. Growing up. Everybody has a fear about growing up. It's all a part of the growing up process. But what exactly do we fear? The thought of going to a new school? Making big decisions? Leaving friends behind? Being left behind? Wearing a tie? Or simply not knowing what will happen next? We all have these fears. Unfortunately, they don't go away when you get older. Actually, it only gets worse. The bigger you get, the fewer places there are to hide. Life will set in and pile up on you. There will be more responsibilities, more work to do, more pressure to succeed. Growing up, the world is a cold and scary place filled with the unknown. But hey, it's not that bad. It's also filled with amazing things and awesome adventures. The older you get, the more you'll experience. You meet new people, make new friends, doors will open, leading you to new worlds and exciting opportunities. Embrace the joy of not knowing what will happen next. Life is supposed to be a surprise. There's no reason to resent getting older. It would be boring if we stayed the same forever. Don't worry too much about growing up. After all, how else will you reach the cookie jar? See, like that one was more, it was a whole lot of animation and somebody could just say, well, that's an animation. But it did kind of have a message, growing up's not so bad, right? <laughs> it was kind of the overall, they, they had supporting evidence and it, that was the conclusion. This one is about procrastination. 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 Procrastination is avoiding doing something. Procrastination is not being able to get started. It's reading a book. It's descaling a kettle. It's color coordinating your shelves. It's sharpening your pencil. Procrastination is spending 30 minutes looking for the right pen. It's spending 10 minutes getting the right pen to work. Procrastination is making a cup of tea. Procrastination is finding the most difficult way of doing something. It's jumping from one idea to another, to another. It's checking your emails. Writing your emails. Procrastination is thesauricizing words in your emails. Procrastination is making a cup of tea. Procrastination is staring out the window. It's watching the neighbors. It's watching television. It's being unable to stop watching television. It's smoking a cigarette. It's doing the dishes. Procrastination is tidying your desk. It's creating a, a fire escape plan. Procrastination is rearranging your furniture. It's playing computer games. It's playing imaginary computer games with your furniture. Procrastination is pairing up your socks. It's writing thank you letters. It's not writing thank you letters. Procrastination is daydreaming. Procrastination is petting something. 
It's watering a plant. It's doodling. Procrastination is trying to grow a mustache. It's chasing a fly. It's tapping your pencil. It's doing eight things at once and not getting one done. Procrastination is taking a nap. Procrastination is getting drunk. It's scratching yourself. It's making a cup of tea. It's cutting your finger. It's oiling the bike. It is picking your nose. It's waiting for the postman. It's trying to avoid the inevitable. Procrastination is writing lists. It's not being able to decide what way to do something. It's overcomplicating things for yourself. It's being afraid to finish something. It's not knowing when to finish something. It's not knowing how to, to finish something. So after you've seen all these good examples, um, we're going to talk about things to keep in mind when you're creating your infographics. And we gave you a handout where we kind of highlighted some of what we thought were important bits and advice that we'd gathered. And I'm going to kind of expound on that as we go through that. So when creating an infographic, uh, the important, one of the important things is knowing your audience. Uh, infographics are for all viewing audiences, but there are some out there that lack uh, fundamental direction or purpose. These types of infographics can be ineffective as a communication tool. So before the design phase, here are a couple questions to ask yourself. What is the purpose of your infographic? What goals will you hope to accomplish by using an infographic as a communication tool? Uh, is the data you are using correct and up to date? Um, so first, you want to prepare your information or, or data. A solid idea is the essential foundation of a great infographic. Uh, you're going to want to think like an editor. Uh, condense and decide what data is the most relevant. Construct a clear, tight, and concise thesis that can be communicated in one sentence. It's a good idea to use that sentence to create the title of your infographic. We want it to be very obvious for the audience uh, so they can immediately contextualize what they see and read. Remember that using boring data will make a boring infographic unless you create a story. So find your intent, whether you're clarifying a complex data set, identifying some kind of trend, explaining a process, or, or making an argument. Figure out if you have all the pieces of information you need to tell your story. Uh, you will usually have a standout or most compelling piece of data. Make this your hook and arrange the rest of your information to support your story. Two, uh, you're going to want to organize and sketch out the infographic. Create a flow chart for your narrative with the hierarchy based around your hook. Organize the information in the order you want it revealed. Three, uh, you're going to design your infographic. Uh, most of all, show, don't tell. Try to create a one-to-one -one ratio of data to graphics. Reduce your text as much as possible with clear imagery. Give numbers and values of physical representation. After all, infographics should be a visual shortcut. And this is uh, an idea of giving numbers and values of physical representation. So this is uh, words used in presidential speeches. throughout the years. So putting this uh, little bubble around your number here really helps you quickly see the higher values and separate them from the lower values. Here's another good one, giving numbers and values of physical representation. So this is the Scoville scale of hotness. So this orange area is the hottest area. So you can kind of immediately make this association. Instead of a whole list of numbers, the viewer's eyes can scan the image and quickly and easily compare the values by the size and the color of the circles. Here's another example. 
Find creative ways of interpreting your subject matter. If your infographic is about baseball, uh, make your pie chart a dissected baseball. If it's about the tobacco industry, make a bar graph out of cigarettes. For instance, this uh, is about medical coverage, so you have uh, your IV bags down here to show your percentages. You want to try to find a theme for your infogra infographic based on the subject matter. You want the reader to know at a glance the type of knowledge you wish to share. This will help unify the image and make it more eye-catching. So pick your theme and kind of pick, uh, brainstorm a little bit, write down some things associated with your theme, and then maybe in those items you can build some visuals to uh, make your, your graphic from. As far as color palette goes, here's some good and bad color palettes. You can see the more vivid colors are a little bit off-putting. These are considered color palettes that work. Then again, some people may love bright, vibrant, eye-burning magenta, but this is just kind of based on, on uh, what people, studies that have shown that the view, average viewer likes more muted tones. Uh, as you can see, this is a, a selection of color palettes here. Usually you want to pick something that's lighter colored, almost like an off-white, and then your mid-tones and then your darker values. Choose a color palette that's easy on the eyes. You want the image to be inviting to look at. We felt like this was a really inviting image to look at about gelato. Try to avoid neon or dominant colors. If you choose a bright color, try to use it as an accent. If it becomes a challenge, uh, use what designers call the rule of three, which is pick three primary colors, pick one for the background, and use uh, different shades of those colors. Here's a bad example of some jarring colors. I think there's just about every one on there. Purples, <laughs> goldish orange, yeah. It's just not very pretty. We're going to talk about fonts a little bit. This is an infographic on choosing a typeface. So you can see here it starts with logo, invitation. Invitation is a good place for script. It makes it look more personal. But for an infographics, like we keep saying, it's all about clarity. So. Uh, your biggest concern should be readability. Uh, you can be creative with the title font of your infographic, but it's almost always best to use a sans serif font for the text within your infographic. So, most of all, you want your infographic clear, inviting, and legible. So, with all that in mind, we're going to go to the file that we downloaded here at the beginning. And we're going to use this program uh, called Inkscape, which is, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with Adobe Illustrator, but it's uh, a graphics application that uses vector graphics, uh, which are scalable and uh, don't use resolution or a loss of resolution whenever you scale something up. There's a lot of, we, we have a lot of different um, sites also on your resources paper that, that have templates for infographics. So if you didn't really want to build one from scratch and you wanted something that was kind of pre-made, that uh, a lot of those sites are really good. We didn't want to use them for the activity because a lot of it is tied into social networking. You'd have to use your Facebook account or something like that. So you may not want to do those, but definitely check out those sites. Not all are like that, but some of them are. 
uh, but they are all really cool. So we recommend using any of those infographic building sites. There's some also, I think uh, there's one on there, if you like word clouds, there's one called Wordle um, that just kind of generate it for you. You enter in your words you want to use for your word cloud and it arranges them for you. 